Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing acute gastric ulceration. Okay, so we've just discussed Cushing ulcers, uh, which occur when uh, you have an intracranial injury. Okay, so an injury on the level of the brain, which then results in the vagus nerves uh, firing inappropriately, which causes overstimulation of the parietal cells of the stomach, which causes over-secretion of hydrochloric acid, and then this hydrochloric acid burns uh, a hole in the mucosal surface of the uh, stomach, and this is known as a Cushing ulcer. Okay, in this next video, what we want to discuss is NZ-induced acute gastric ulceration. Okay, so let's firstly discuss what the NZs are. Okay, so uh, NZ stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So the N is for non, the S is for steroidal, and then the A is for anti, the I is for inflammatory, and then the D is for drug. Okay, so uh, the NSAIDs are very famous drugs. Many of the drugs that you will have taken before in your life will be NSAIDs, okay? So uh, examples include the drug aspirin, uh, the drug ibuprofen. Uh, slightly less well-known examples, but still very famous drugs are indomethacin and diclofenac. Okay, so aspirin, ibuprofen, indomethacin, and also at diclofenac. All of these drugs uh, work by inhibiting cyclooxygenase enzymes, which are involved in the production of prostaglandins. Okay, so let's discuss the synthesis of prostaglandins then. So basically, you start off with uh, a long-chain carboxylic acid molecule called arachidonic acid. Okay. And basically, arachidonic acid can then be converted into prostaglandin G2, okay, and for short, prostaglandin G2 is often uh, denoted as PGG2, okay, so for short, we can call this PG for prostaglandin, and then G2, and then you can convert prostaglandin G2 then into prostaglandin H2, okay, and again, for short, prostaglandin H2 can be abbreviated to PGH2. Okay, so this is PGH2. And both of these conversions, the conversion from arachidonic acid into prostaglandin G2 and the conversion from prostaglandin G2 into prostaglandin H2 are catalyzed by cyclooxygenase enzymes. Okay, now these reactions are so important that they actually have their own names. So this first reaction where you go from arachidonic acid into prostaglandin G2, this is called the cyclooxygenase reaction. Okay, and the second reaction where you go from prostaglandin G2 into prostaglandin H2, uh, this is known as the peroxidase reaction. Okay, but both of them are catalyzed by uh, cyclooxygenase enzymes. Okay, now there are two major forms of cyclooxygenase enzymes called cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. Okay, so these are catalyzed by cyclo oxygenase enzymes, and usually the cyclooxygenase enzymes are uh, abbreviated to COX, basically, C for cyclo, and then OX for oxygenase, so there is COX-1 and there is COX-2, okay, and both of them can catalyze these reactions. Now, uh, the basis of the use of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, as um, anti-inflammatory drugs is that uh, many of the downstream products that you can then create from prostaglandin H2 are extremely pro-inflammatory and when you stop their production then you can reduce the inflammatory response. Okay. Um, However, the problem, the side effect of non-steroid or anti-inflammatory drugs is that they can induce gastric ulcers. So let's try and understand how they can induce gastric ulcers. So basically, in uh, most of the cells of the gastric mucosa, you have COX-1 enzymes. Okay, cyclooxygenase 1 enzymes. And these cyclooxygenase 1 enzymes are converting arachidonic acid into at first the prostaglandin G2 and then finally into prostaglandin H2 in the cells of the gastric mucosa. Okay, and it's most of the cells of the gastric mucosa that have uh, this COX-1. So if we go back to our anatomical picture, 
the epithelial cells will have COX-1 along with the cells within the lamina propria. So every cell is basically, well almost every cell will be secreting uh, certain prostaglandins. Now which prostaglandin is produced by these stomach mucosal cells? Well basically they take the prostaglandin E2, oh, sorry, they take the prostaglandin H2 and they convert it into prostaglandin E2 and this is the prostaglandin then that they secrete. Okay, so let's go over the page and write this further. So basically from prostaglandin H2, what you then go to is prostaglandin E2, and this is occurring in these cells of the gastric mucosa. Okay, so PGE2, short for prostaglandin E2. And this conversion from prostaglandin H2 to prostaglandin E2 is catalyzed by the enzyme prostaglandin E2 synthase. Okay, right. And then the prostaglandin E2 will be secreted by these gastric mucosal cells. And what does it usually do? Well, usually it acts to protect the gastric mucosa from gastric ulceration, i.e. from being burnt by too high qu uh, quantities of uh, hydrochloric acid. So it has many different actions. Firstly, it acts on the epithelial cells themselves. So let's say this is a columnar epithelial cell. And you will remember that the columnar epithelial cells secrete uh, mucus and they also secrete bicarbonate anions uh, in that mucus. So basically on the surface of these um, columnar epithelial cells, you have receptors for prostaglandin E2, okay? And firstly, you have a receptor whose downstream pathway triggers an increase in the production of mucus, okay? And this is the EP4 receptor. Okay, and EP4 stands for prostaglandin E4 uh, receptor type 4, basically. Sorry, prostaglandin E2 uh, receptor type 4. Okay, so this is prostaglandin E2 and then receptor type 4. So they kind of put the E in front of the prostaglandin. So they put the E first and then they've got the prostaglandin and then it's receptor type 4. Okay, so this is the type 4 prostaglandin E2 receptor, and it's a G-protein coupled receptor. And again, it's a G-protein coupled receptor within the family of rhodopsin-like uh, G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so it has a rather small amino terminal domain and a rather small carboxylic acid tail, and it binds its ligand uh, within the transmembrane domain, okay? So the ligand binds to residues that are within the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, okay? And these columnar epithelial cells have this prostaglandin E2 receptor type 4 on their surfaces, okay? And prostaglandin E2, which is being secreted by uh, cells of the gastric mucosa, will act on this receptor. And what it triggers is it triggers an increase in mucus production, okay? So increased mucus production. So these uh, columnar epithelial cells will increase their mu mucus production and therefore they are protecting themselves against uh, the hydrochloric acid uh, that's within the lumen of the stomach. Okay, so you'll get more mucus put on the surface. In addition, they also have a separate receptor which again prostaglandin E2 works on. Okay, and this receptor will trigger an increase in the secretion of bicarbonate anions. And there are actually two receptors on the surface of the columnar epithelial cells which trigger this increase in the secretion of bicarbonate anions. And both of them are heterotrimeric G, sorry, both of them are G protein coupled receptors again. So here we have our G protein coupled receptor again. And they are both G protein coupled receptors within the rhodopsin family of G protein coupled receptors. So again, the ligand binds to residues within the seven membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay. And uh, these are the prostaglandin E2, so PE, uh, well, EP, like so, receptor type 1, and then also the prostaglandin E2 receptor type 2. So both of these receptors are on the surface of the columnar epithelial cells and when prostaglandin E2 binds to them, what they trigger in the columnar epithelial cells is increased bicarbonate secretion. 
Okay, and remember, bicarbonate anions will go into the mucus, and any protons which are coming through that mucus, they will bind to the bicarbonate anions and therefore be neutralized. So the bicarbonate anions will mop up the protons, basically, um, and that will protect the columnar epithelial cell underneath from uh, the... Um, the um, high uh, free proton concentration within the lumen of the stomach. Okay, so here are two protective actions of prostaglandin E2. So maybe you can start to think why blocking the production of prostaglandin E2 via the NCADs, uh is not a good idea, basically. Okay, it gets worse, however, because prostaglandin E2 does something else. Basically, it also acts on the enterochromaffin-like cells, which, remember, are controlling the secretion of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells. So here is our parietal cell with this funny shape and the canaliculi, and here's its nucleus. And then we have underneath our enterochromaffin-like cell here, which is... Uh, well, dispensing um, histamine onto the parietal cell to control the release of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cell. Okay, so basically, you also have uh, receptors for prostaglandin E2 on the surface of the enterochromaffin-like cell here, the ECL cell. Okay, and these are prostaglandin E2 receptors of type 2 and type 3. Okay, so you have prostaglandin E2 receptor type 2s on the surface of the enterochromaffin-like cells, and you also have prostaglandin E2 receptor type 3s, EP3s, on the surface of the enterochromaffin-like cell, and both of them trigger the same thing. They trigger a decrease in the production of histamine, okay, so less histamine will be released, okay, and if the enterochromaffin-like cells uh, release less histamine, then the parietal cells will be receiving less histamine, and therefore they will secrete less hydrochloric acid. So overall, what does prostaglandin E2 do? Does What does prostaglandin E2 do? Well, um, it protects the columnar epithelial cells by increasing their secretion of mucus and also their secretion of bicarbonate anions. And also, it shuts down, it tries to reduce the acidity of the lumen, okay, by uh, reducing histamine secretion by the enterochromaffin-like cells, taking histamine secretion below what it would be at basal levels, okay, and therefore reducing the basal level of hydrochloric acid secretion by the um, parietal cells. Okay, and both of these actions are aimed at protecting uh, the uh, gastric mucosa from being burnt by the stomach acid. So, when you prescribe NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, indomethacin, or diclofenac, they will inhibit the cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme, which is within the gastric mucosal cells, okay? And this will stop the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2, okay? And with no prostaglandin H2, you can't convert prostaglandin H2 into prostaglandin E2, so you can't synthesize prostaglandin E2. And if you don't synthesize prostaglandin E2, you lose these protective mechanisms. You lose the signaling that tells the columnar epithelial cells to increase their mucus secretion and their bicarbonate secretion, and you also in lose the signaling which tells the enterochromaffin-like cells to reduce their release of histamine, to reduce the secretion of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells. Okay, both of these things lead to increased uh, secretion of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells and also decreased protection and therefore can propagate acute gastric ulceration. They can cause uh, the stomach lining to end up being burnt by uh, two acidic environments, which the stomach lining is no longer protected against. Okay, and that's why um, NSAID therapy can cause uh, gastric ulceration. Okay, right. There are ways around this now. We have selective COX-2 inhibitors. Okay, so the problem with the uh, old NSAIDs, the old non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, indomethacin, uh, diclofenac, 
is that they block both cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. However, the main cyclooxygenase, which is important uh, within uh, the acute inflammatory response, is cyclooxygenase 2. So there's an opportunity there because if the acute gastric ulceration occurs by inhibition of cyclooxygenase 1, but the beneficial effects of the drug work by blocking cyclooxygenase 2, then if we made a drug that was selective for cyclooxygenase 2, then in principle we would have a drug that still had the anti-inflammatory effects but didn't cause uh, gastric ulceration. Uh, now there are problem with there are problems with cyclooxygenase 2 selective inhibitors to say the least and that is that they can actually increase the risk of ha having a heart attack basically. Okay, uh, and this led to one of the uh, cyclooxygenase 2 selective inhibitors, rofecoxib, being withdrawn from the market in 2004. So this drug was given to people, however, it was withdrawn because many people had heart attacks whilst taking it, which was not good. Okay, uh, so there are still some uh, COX-2 selective uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, but they're not as selective as rofecoxib. Rofecoxib was a triumph pharmacologically. It was an absolutely brilliant drug as far as being selective for COX-2 was concerned. The problem was that being selective too selective for COX-2 actually causes heart attacks. Okay, so we actually want drugs that are sort of selective for COX-2 but still inhibit COX-1 to a bit, but aren't as uh, equally uh, blocking for COX-1 as COX-2 uh, as the original NSAIDs such as aspirin, uh, ibuprofen, diclofenac, indomethacin. So senecoxib is an example of a sort of and it is a COX-2 selective drug, but it's not as though it doesn't block COX-1 as well. It's just it prefers COX-2 over COX-1. Rothecoxib was too good at it, and that would cause the problem, basically. Uh, there's another COX-2 selective uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitor, uh, which is Itoricoxib. And Celecoxib, I believe, is available worldwide. Itoricoxib, I don't think, has been approved by the American FDA um, because America was hit very hard by rofecoxib, so they're very wary of cyclooxygenase 2 selective inhibitors. But Itoricoxib is, in, is approved, I believe, in Europe. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is NZ-induced uh, gastric ulceration. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll look at uh, therapies to avoid uh, acute gastric ulceration.